Okay, our next speaker um, is Nate Lilatius, uh, who is a senior architect at Northworks Architects and Planners and is a member of the steering committee for the Chicago chapter of the Custom Residential Architects Network. Um, he has toured, lectured, and written about the built environment for AIA Chicago, the National Trust, and many other organizations. Uh, Lilatius will discuss Marktown, um, an idealized company town designed by Shaw in 1917 for the Mark Manufacturing Company in Indiana. He will also explore the movement for improved worker housing, the influences of the English Garden City, and Shaw's concepts for spatial planning. Um, as soon as uh, Nate has concluded, uh, we will have a 25-minute break, during which time we will serve birthday cake in Fellowship Hall, and then we will start back at 11.15. So I invite Nate Lilatius. Thank you very much. I'm very excited to be here today. Thank you, Bill. Uh, I also want to quickly thank Paul Myers, who is uh, here from Marktown. Uh, he was invaluable in aiding and uh, putting together this presentation. Um, Marktown is really fascinating because it's Shaw's only example of a planned community that contained residential uh, structures, commercial structures, uh, parks, uh, and civic structures. Uh, here we have uh, Clayton Mark uh, on the left. He was the, he commissioned Mark Town. And we have Howard Van Dornshaw on the right. Um, I think all the presenters were trying to find the most unique photos of Shaw, since you're seeing a lot of them today. This is a picture of Shaw in 1893, when he was still working with Mundy uh, and Jenny. And this is a photo from their office. Uh, Clayton Mark um, moved to Chicago in 1872, and he was only 14 years old, uh, and he got into the steel industry. His father was a dry goods wholesaler, um, but he went in a different direction. And he originally um, founded the Mark Manufacturing Company in 1888 uh, with his father uh, in Evanston, Illinois. And by 1905, it was the largest employer in the city of Evanston. Um, he decided that he wanted to build his own steel mill in Indiana Harbor and he wanted to control the supply of steel um, for his company. Uh, Marktown was not the first commission uh, between uh, Clayton Mark and Howard Van Doren Shaw. Um, as Stuart mentioned earlier, and uh, Bill also showed an image, um, this is uh, Clayton Mark's residence in Lake Forest from 1913, uh, I'm sorry, 1914, and Shaw had also designed Clayton Mark's uh, father's house in Evanston the year previous. Um, when Clayton Mark decided to build a steel mill in Indiana Harbor, uh, he also commissioned Shaw at the same time uh, to build a worker community. Um, the area around Indiana Harbor was a heavily industrialized region uh, with many factories and steel mills and it actually has um, several examples of uh, industrial worker housing um, created by different companies. So here's a map of the region, and I'll just point out a few elements. Um, so this projection into Lake Michigan is Indiana Harbor itself. Um, it was built as a connection between Lake Freight, uh, the Calumet River, and rail traffic. Um, uh, started as its own town, um, but now part of Chicago, you have Pullman, which was uh, platted and uh, built for the, the Pullman Company by uh, Beeman. Um, now part of Chicago as well, you have Hedgewish, uh, which was started by the Hedgewish Company. Um, Marktown itself here right at uh, the edge of where uh, Indiana Harbor meets the natural lakeshore. Um, within East Chicago, you have Sunnyside, which was designed and built for the Inland Steel Company. Uh, and then, of course, the mother of all company towns, you have Gary, Indiana, uh, which was founded and platted for uh, uh, U.S. Steel. 
Um, there were many reasons that corporations were looking to build worker housing. Um, this is the progressive era when uh, thinkers were trying to resolve issues of urbanization, uh, industrialization, uh, and immigration. Um, these factories had very high turnover um, front with their workers, and uh, in researching the problem, it turned out that housing was the main issue. Um, so there was a big reason for these companies to invest in these communities for their workers. Um, these new towns had many conveniences um, that were improvements over previous ways of living. Uh, Marktown was built with electric lighting. It had indoor plumbing with sewer connections. Uh, there was a separate dining room, uh, piped gas, hot air heat, and access to natural light and ventilation. The uh, industrial worker community and planned um, communities were not exclusive to the United States. Uh, contemporary to the Progressive Era, uh, there was the Garden City movement going on in England uh, that was looking at a way to house the burgeoning population and really looking at the way to zone housing, uh, commercial enterprise, industry, and agriculture. Um, this is an image of Hampstead Garden Suburb uh, by Parker and Unwin from 1906. And you can see that Shaw was not only deeply influenced by the progressive uh, movement and the Garden City movement um, as a planning uh, exercise, but also was really influenced by the forms coming out of the English arts and crafts movement. So on the um, top left is an image, an aerial image of uh, Indiana Harbor. And you can see the way it projects out into the lake. Uh, it has canals for um, freight. Let's point out some of the uh, elements here. Um, and you can also see that Marktown is down here on the, this little corner right here. So this is what we're talking about as far as the landscape of where uh, Marktown exists. The original plan for Marktown was much more extensive than what was actually constructed. Um, you can see the uh, proposed plan is over here. And I actually just colorized the portion of the plan that was constructed. So you can see the yellow is the part of Marktown that was built. Um, but the original plan was much more extensive. Um, the community was going to have a market square, uh, much like Lake Forest. There was a uh, streetcar connection um, going into um, East Chicago. Um, there would be civic structures, schools, uh, parks, um, a theater, and all the elements of a uh, self-sufficient community. Um, Mark built his uh, factory first. He purchased the land from Henry Frick in uh, 1913. Uh, construction of the community was delayed a little bit by uh, World War I and uh, some of the rationing from that war. Um, at, at its height, uh, Mark Manufacturing employed around 14,000 people um, in the region. So you can see there was a really great need um, for this housing. In comparison today, um, Ars uh, ArcelorMetal at Indiana Harbor, which is one of the largest integrated steelmaking facilities in the US, um, employs about 4,000 people. Uh, Marktown itself was planned to have 8,000 um, residents um, with a variety of, of the building types. Um, so on the left is the plan of Marktown as it was built, and then on the right there's a blow-up plan of what Market Square um, would have looked like. Only one side of Market Square was built, but there was a commercial building constructed uh, to designs by Shaw. Um, on my right, or on the right here, this is Market Square in Marktown as it was built. You can see there's this really wonderful sunken plaza with a fountain. Uh, you'll notice uh, the commercial building. Um, here's a close-up of that commercial structure. And then at the very end here, this is uh, Lake Forest Market Square. So you can see how similar the styles were, and, and Shaw was really borrowing from his um, previous experience. 
The square was actually removed, the fountain and square were removed in 1936 uh, to improve traffic flow. And because it was built on the edge of the community and wasn't really in the heart of the community as was planned, um, it, it definitely struggled. Um, this is an example of how Shaw laid out the blocks. And I added some colors here just to make it a little clearer. Um, and then there's some photos can you, so you can see some of the um, uh, consequences of the way he laid out buildings. Um, the, the lots themselves are these alternating um, green uh, squares. And then the houses are uh, shaded gray. And you'll see that Shaw mostly constructed uh, semi-detached and detached housing. Uh, and he alternated their locations on the block. So you have these really interesting moments where you're looking through houses and you'll see the houses on the opposite block um, across. He laid out the houses to maximize access to light and ventilation, and so that when you were in your house, you were always looking over your garden or your neighbor's garden. And then being built in such an industrialized area, these controlled views really kept the feeling of the community uh, as a quaint village that was, that was insular. These are some early images of Marktown. Uh, this is uh, when the community was, uh, had just been constructed. Um, these are from Architectural Review. And you'll notice the houses have not yet received their exterior stucco finish. So you're, you're, what you're seeing is the clay tile um, construction of the houses. This is a little... Um, field guide I put together for a walking tour we gave of Marktown. This is sort of a representation of the pieces of um, the, the different building types that Shaw used. Um, what Shaw did is he really created a few elements that he mixed together in unique ways uh, to create the interesting forms of Marktown. So just to walk you through the guide, on this side you have the vast majority of the buildings that you find in Marktown. And there's really three major types. Um, these are all duplex houses, or these two are duplex houses, and then there's a single family home um, on the right. Um, in each one, there's a, there's a variety in the house types. So for instance, the middle one is the six room duplex, but here you have it with the double gable facing the street, here you have it with a hipped roof, and here you have it with the double gable uh, facing uh, the, the yard. There's also a larger uh, quad building, and this has four units in it. Then there was a, uh, a larger uh, uh, home, a seven-room home. There were three workers' houses built, which have a little bit of a higher finish than the worker housing. Uh, here's an image of the boarding house, and then the Market Square building. Some of the elements that Shaw used were uh, two over three casement windows, either single or double. Um, he had a couple of varieties of bay windows. Uh, he brought down uh, eaves at doorways. So you see a lot of times where you have the entry to the house, you have a low eave kind of marking that entrance and really bringing it down to human scale. Originally, even the colors of the house were uh, regimented, but uh, changed. So the, originally the houses, just the wood trim, would either be red and black, orange and black, green and black, or blue and white. These are a few of Shah's country homes, and you've seen some of these houses previously. Um, here's the House of the Four Winds, which um, Stuart Cohen discussed. Here's the Becker House, uh, and here's the Peck House. And I wanted to show these images to, just to show that Shaw was working with these building blocks um, before he designed Marktown. Um, what's really interesting about Marktown is because he wasn't building for the wealthy owner of a company. He was building for the workers of the company. So he really started to distill down these elements that he had developed working on country houses and kept distilling them down into these really pure um, elements. So here you obviously see Shah's famous for his double gable, and here you see it again. 
But you also see these long roofs coming down to single-story porches, uh, both here and then at the House of the Four Winds. You see uh, windows that are right up against the eave line of the house. And you see these very uh, narrow fascia boards at the ends of the eaves. The walls themselves are very smooth, unadorned stucco. And then, of course, I always wonder if this was Shah's personal favorite style because he used it on his own house in Ragdale. Um, here you see a double gable. You see the recessed entry. Uh, and then here you have a long roof coming down uh, to a porch. Um, here are some images from Marktown. Um, these are from about five years ago. Um, and just pointing out some of the elements, here you can see how these really narrow streets um, end in buildings, so the views are always contained within the community. Um, originally, the houses did not have garages. They still don't have garages. And the idea was that all uh, auto owners would park their, their cars in public garages that were concentrated together in one area. Um, obviously, that's not worked out so well today, and uh, people park on the street. <clears throat> Here you see some, um, some of the same uh, building types with different forms. On the very end, you can see a little double gable house. Um, here's a hipped uh, version. Nice eave coming down to make a really low eave over the entryway, which is really um, a hallmark of, of the ha uh, houses at Marktown. The doors are usually on the sides of the house that open into the uh, side gardens instead of to the street as well. Um, this is the most common building type at Marktown. This is the uh, six-room duplex. And as discussed previously, there's three variations. Here you have the gable facing the street. Here you have the gable facing the garden. And then here you have the hipped roof. This house would have had three bedrooms, all upstairs, with a small bathroom and the stair. And then on the main floor, you've had a parlor, dining room, and kitchen. Then all the houses had basements. Uh, here are some other uh, building types. This is the seven-room duplex with just one variety. Uh, entry porches off of the two ends. Um, the seven-room duplex has also had really nice um, iron window uh, boxes, which I'll show you to, an example of. Um, this is the uh, four-room duplex. This is a, a very small house with a little side porch like the uh, seven-room duplex houses. And the largest residential building were these quad buildings. Um, which are a little bit like the six-room duplexes spread apart uh, with two additional um, units added into the middle. Um, so for these duplexes and the quads, all the units were uh, two stories and the buildings were really kind of split. This is an example of a uh, six-room single family. And you can see that again, the entry is recessed and there's a low eave marking where that entry occurs. So at Marktown, uh, Shaw was really boiling down the budget and the details to these really pure elements. And I just wanted to point out some of the places where he did add that extra detail um, to make these really special. Um, in many cases, Shaw would add that detail around the entryway uh, where you'd see it. Um, but here's the uh, window boxes in the seven room duplexes. And here you can see some of the casement windows that are typical. Um, many people have enclosed uh, their little um, side porches, uh, but here's an example of one that's still, and it um, hasn't been modified. You can see there's really nice exposed rafter tails, this beadboard soffit. <clears throat> um, here's one example of uh, one of Shah's bay windows, and here's another on the quad house. And you can see that while the houses are largely stucco, he did add some clabbered siding 
uh, here at the entryway. Behind this um, plywood would be where the front door of this house was located. Um, this is a, an image of the um, boarding house. This was a 40 room um, boarding house. It has two wings, as you can see here and here. Uh, one side would have been for uh, men, one side would have, would have been for women. Um, you go through the entrance, there'd be a large um, a lobby and then a dining hall. You can see some of those uh, really typical features of Mar Marktown and Shaw's work. You have the double gable, you have this low eave at the entrance, and then you have uh, the casement, two over three casement windows. There were originally porches at the ends of these wings. You can see that those are uh, missing. And, and actually this building has since been demolished, unfortunately. Um, Shaw also designed three managers' houses for the community. Um, originally this street would have been a full uh, row of managers' houses on both sides of the street. Um, up here you see an early image of those managers' houses. And I think when you see them side by side like this, you can really see how, once again, uh, Shaw has taken a single idea and then sort of twisted it a little bit to come up with three uh, varieties. Um, so here's some images of those houses. You can see that long eave coming down to the first floor, uh, gable ends stuck on the top, but these houses had brick on the bottom. Uh, these also had their own private brick garages at the back of the lots. Uh, and to give you a sense of um, the siting of this community, um, this is the BP Whiting um, refinery, and this is when I took these photos of these managers' houses, um, this is the view when I turned around and just took the photo the other way. You can see the areas become heavily industrialized. I wanted to uh, just show some of Shaw's construction techniques as well. Um, we were talking a little bit earlier about how you hear a lot about Howard Van Dorn, or uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's buildings having issues with water infiltration and basically fitness. Uh, but you don't really hear that about Shah's buildings. His buildings tend to be very well constructed. And here where there's some missing um, stucco, you can see the original clay tile wall construction, uh, and then you can see the wood furring with the uh, exterior stucco application. Here's a close-up image of some of those um, stucco tiles. Some would be hollow, and then some would be filled uh, to reinforce, for instance, the corners. Um, here's an image of the town early on um, before the houses were stuccoed, so this, this was the house kind of right after being constructed. Um, here you can see an interior wall. This is a quad structure that half of the structure was demolished. So what you're looking at here is interior plaster that was on this um, party wall. Uh, and then here you can see uh, here's where there's a missing um, porch roof, um, and you can see the clay tile wall beyond and how uh, Shaw just used these outriggers um, let into the clay tile wall to attach this porch roof. Um, and then here you see some of the wonderful examples of the two over three casement windows, really simple stucco returns, and then the stucco sill. Um, the, th the, the community of Marktown is definitely um, in a difficult position today, and there is a lot of threat to the community. Um, there's a few forces um, leading to that threat. Um, obviously, the industrialized setting of the community um, is a challenge. Um, also, the BP Whiting Refinery, which is um, the picture I showed you from the manager's houses, um, they actively want to demolish the community um, they don't like having um, a residential community near, near their factory. Um, there's also, in, in general, in the, in the, in the region, um, uh, more broadly, there's a lot of disinvestment. 
um, in East Chicago and Hammond and, and that part of Indiana. Um, and there's also been really poor um, code enforcement within East Chicago um, to encourage people to, to maintain their homes. Um, but Marktown is, is really uh, a significant community. Um, obviously, we're here to talk about Shah and celebrate him as a uh, significant architect. And he's really one of the top um, practitioners of the British arts and crafts style in the United States. Um, and, and the community is a really wonderful example of progressive era um, planning and industrial worker housing. Um, I really think it's on par with, with Pullman. Those are two really wonderful examples of different eras of um, worker community. Um, we are having a walking tour at Marktown um, this fall. Uh, I believe there's some information in your pamphlet, um, but there's also uh, the information on the, on the slide. Um, but if you haven't been out to, to Marktown, it's definitely, definitely worth the trip and uh, definitely worth uh, learning more about. Thank you very much.